Hello, CLC. It's good to be with you today, and I pray that you've had a wonderful week. I uh, pray that uh, life's, well, life's not going to treat you good, but I pray that you've been blessed and that the Lord has really been speaking to your heart. Uh, you know, still times are crazy, and what we're going to get into today, we're going to be finally getting into the book of Revelation here in just a few moments. As we do, we've got to remember that things, as bad as they may seem to be right now, one day are going to get a whole lot worse. And that's not gloom and doom for us, because remember, we as children of God, we as Christians are going to be out of here. But everything going on now is leading up to just chaos and more chaos and more turmoil and more nation against nation. And we see weather systems changing and getting worse. It seems like uh, here in the United States, uh, as a kid, I, I don't recall ever seeing uh, the earthquakes and the tornadoes and the hurricanes that we're seeing today. I'm sure we probably did. And it just wasn't as before our face with TV and, and, and social media and stuff. But uh, it just seems like things are getting crazier and wackier and, and uh, our political system is all out of whack and people are hating one another and people are boycotting and rioting and just, just craziness. Well, we're gonna look here today and we're gonna be talking about the unholy trinity. And you say, say what? Now, when I say unholy, that's what I'm talking about. We'll get into it in just a moment. But when we look in the book of Revelation and, and chapter 13, which we're not going to read today, we'll probably get into it a little bit next week. But it talks about, it describes a deceiving uh, imitation of the Trinity, the Holy Trinity, an imitation, a deceiving imitation of the Holy Trinity that includes Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. And uh, we'll talk more about the false prophet next week. Today, we're going to hit mostly, we'll talk about Satan for just a few moments because we all pretty much know who he is and what he's about. We're going to hit a little bit more on the Antichrist today. We've been talking about him over the last couple of weeks, about him coming. Daniel talked about him last week, you know, some 2,500 years ago, was prophesying that he would be here one day. And so uh, we're going to hit on him. But before we do, let's pray and ask God's blessings upon the reading of his word and that he would open up our ears and our hearts to the truth of his word. Father, thank you. We are truly blessed. We thank you, Lord, that we can call you our Father. We thank you, Father, for Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice, that you gave your life, you died on the cross, but you raised again on the third day, Lord, victorious so that we could have life, and we thank you for that. And as you left, Jesus, we thank you that you sent your spirit to live within us and to lead us and to guide us. And so, Holy Spirit, today we ask that you would just open up our ears and our hearts to hear what you'd have to say to us. Teach us from your word, and we're going to thank you for it. We pray your blessings upon this time. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 24. We're going to be in verse 15 and then 21 and 22. We've read this over the last two or three weeks. And as we're talking about the end times, it's very important that we continue to keep this before ourselves. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, Jesus says this. So, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, we talked about him last week, when you see him standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. And then verse 21 says, For there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world uh, until now, no, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So again, Jesus is talking about this time to come, this 70th week that hasn't happened yet that we talked about in Daniel. And I probably confused you. I confused a lot of people with all those numbers. But just remember this. Of the 70 weeks, 70 times 7 years, 490 years, 69 of those weeks have already happened. 69, 483 of those years have already taken place. It, it brought us up to the time that Jesus entered triumphantly into Jerusalem as Messiah. So then God took Israel and he set them over to the side for, for a time. And they're still set to the side. He's not done with them yet. Always remember that. But um, this time of tribulation, the seven years of tribulation, is going to be that final week, that 70th week, that seven-year period that has yet to take place that Daniel talked about. So as we look and we look at... Uh, the Antichrist today, we have to realize that he's part of the uh, unholy trinity. The holy trinity consists of, remember, God the Father, right, and God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit, 
That's the Holy Trinity, God, the Godhead, three in one. Their counterpart is the unholy trinity, and, and that uh, includes Satan. Satan is a counterfeit of God. He wanted to be God. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, he's the anti-God. Then there's the first beast, or the antichrist, antichrist. Okay, he's the, um, uh, if you will, he's the uh, false Jesus. And then uh, the false prophet, or the second beast, is the anti-spirit. So what you've got is you've got this unholy trinity, and you've got Satan who wants to be God. You've got the Antichrist who's portraying Jesus, but in an unholy way. And then you've got the false prophet or, or the second beast who is uh, um, trying to make himself out to be the Holy Spirit. You see, it's a common tactic of Satan uh, to imitate or counterfeit the things of God in order to make himself to be like God. Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 talk about when he was kicked out of heaven. He was trying to place himself up above God. He, he was jealous of God. He wanted to be God. And so uh, he even says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. And pride is what caused him. So understand that he's always trying to counterfeit or imitate the things of God. And he's very good, even in the religious system of today, and I'm sure it's always been this way, He's always had a counterfeit. He's got false prophets. He always has. Um, he's got people going around claiming to be of God who are not, who are drawing good people away uh, from the truth of the Word of God. So we have to be careful, and we have to understand. And remember, I've always said this, and you know this, uh, it's, but it's worth repeating. You know, banks don't, um, they don't study counterfeit bills. They study the real thing. So when you know what the real thing looks like, you will always be able to spot a counterfeit. And so when we know God, when we know his word, when we understand salvation through Jesus, when, we're, when we understand the work of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit, then when anything comes along that tries to make itself look like that, look like God, look like Jesus, look like the Holy Spirit, look like the word of God, but we know what the original truly looks like, we will spot that it's not real. So as people are getting uh, drawn away from the truth of the Word of God in the name of religion or in the name of even Christianity, when you know what the real thing looks like, you won't be tempted to be drawn away to that which is counterfeit. I'm talking about Satan. Second Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4 says, Even if our gospel is veiled... It is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God, little g, of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And, and so Satan, the Bible calls him the God, little g, of this world. It's, it's a place that God the Father, our Heavenly Father, has allowed him uh, to be in for a period but it's going to come to an end. You see, right now, um, you might even say that he has some ownership in the world and in the things of the world, but it's only because God, our Father, Yahweh, has allowed it to happen. And so when we get into the book of Revelation, we see that God is going to take back ownership. Jesus is going to end up reigning supreme over the world, and then there's going to be a new earth one of these days. John 12, 31 calls Satan the ruler of this world. Again, showing his power is limited to matters on the earth, the ruler of this world, not the ruler of all creation. That's God the Father. Ephesians 2, 2 calls Satan the prince of the power of the air. It's a variation of the same title. I like to say the prince of the power of the air waves in today's society. Uh, titles for Satan and Revelation, which we will be hitting over the next few weeks. Dragon, devil, old serpent, deceiver, accuser. These are all titles given to Satan. So we're going to take off in Revelation chapter 4. And the reason we're starting in chapter 4 is because chapters 1 through 3 is dealing with the church. Okay, you've got to catch that. The church is not anywhere between chapters 4 and 19 until, the, until we come to the end of 19. We see nothing about the church. We see no reason to believe the church has any part in this tribulation period because we believe, I believe, I teach, I believe scripture is clear that the church is going to be snatched away, raptured, 
uh, before all this starts. And so as we talked a couple, three weeks ago, when the church is taken out of this, the Holy Spirit, and we'll see here in just a moment, is going to be uh, removed. And so then the Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet are going to have free reign for parts of seven years. And then we're going to see everything break loose. We're going to see God's judgment, God's wrath. That's what we're saved from, the wrath to come. Okay. So Revelation chapter 4, uh, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it was given to John uh, by God to show his, God's servants, what must soon take place. And so John spends the first three chapters saying what Jesus had told him to say to the churches. And so we pick it up in chapter 4, verse 1. John says, and after this, after Jesus giving him uh, the understanding of what's going to take place with churches and stuff like that, he said, after this, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me uh, like a trumpet, said, he's talking about Jesus. And he hears the voice of Jesus. He says, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. After what? After everything that takes place with the churches, churches raptured out. Now I'm going to show you what must take place after this. At once, John says, I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. The one seated on the throne was God himself. And, and then we don't have time to go into it right now, but John talks about the glory of what was taking place, the throne and those around the throne and different things. And, and later on, as we study, we will hit more on who's around the throne and what's taking place. But then we go on over to chapter five of Revelation. John says, then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, God, saw in his right hand a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. Well, Daniel in chapter 12 talks about uh, these seals and, and, and Daniel is told to seal up everything that he's been told for it's not to be spoken out yet. So here it is now being revealed what's in the seals. He said in verse two, and I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? It's not just a scroll that anybody could open. And so the angel is going around saying, who can open it? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. John says in, in verse 4, And I began to weep loudly because no one was wor found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Who is the Lion of the tribe of Judah? That's Jesus. The Root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. So get the picture here. Jesus is taking the scroll from God the Father. So we jump down to Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. Where we want to get right into the scrolls, okay? And we're going to get into the very first part of the scroll. We're going to talk about the first uh, thing that John sees coming from, from the reading of these scrolls. He says, now, verse 1, I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures, we're pretty sure that those are, are angels. I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, come. What he's doing is he's calling. He, he, he's saying, come. Now, who's he talking to? John said, and I looked and behold a white horse and its rider had a bow and a crown was given to him. And he came out conquering and to conquer. Now, if you were here with me, looking at me, I would ask you this question, which I will ask the people when I'm before them. Who is this rider on the white horse? And many people are going to say, Jesus. Well, this is not Jesus. Remember, Jesus is the one holding the scrolls, opening the scrolls, and he's talking about what is to come. Again, this was back 2,000 years ago that this is being given to John while he's out uh, on the island of Patmos. And, uh, and so as Jesus is reading this to him, he's letting him know what's going to take place during the 70th week that Daniel talked about. And this person riding on this white horse is none other than the Antichrist. And see, 
The world, after the rapture, will be looking for a man or, or someone or something on a white horse uh, who will convince everyone that, that he's a man of peace. They're going to be looking for somebody to bring peace. Here's coming this white horse. And the image in Revelation 6-2 supports this peace-bringing interpretation. I want us to look at it. You see, the crown the rider wears is one of victory. Back in the day when a king would go out fighting and conquer, he would come back in parading on a white horse and he'd be wearing a crown and everybody would be cheering and whatever and he would just come in all proud and, and whatnot. The crown that the rider wears is one of victory, but his bow has no arrows. Interesting. It's the picture of a bloodless victory gained through peaceful negotiations. And that's what the Antichrist is going to do when he comes on the scene. Remember, for the first three and a half years, he's going to have made peace with Israel and all of Israel's en enemies. And even though things are going to be happening, the, the, the weather, the uh, things going on around the world are still going to be taking place, this man is going to bring, bring peace to the Middle East, something that's never truly happened. And in the midst of the nations threatening each other with nuclear war and, and terrorists becoming even more sophisticated with their weaponry uh, and, and the church uh, having been removed, remember, that's a very important thing to understand. With the church gone, there's going to be more chaos because now there's no, um, there's no, what's the word I'm looking for? There, there, there's no peacefulness from God that's, that's, that's on the earth. The church is gone. So there's going to be even more chaos. The final dictator is going to be promising peace and prosperity. And he will be welcomed as the savior and hope of the world because things are going to be getting so crazy and, and um, people just running wild. The Antichrist will be a political genius. He's going to be a masterful diplomat and probably a very, very clever leader. His eloquence and, and promises will mesmerize the masses and armies and governments will be united under his leadership and the people of the earth will sigh in relief because finally peace. You know, the world's always looked for peace and it's never had true total peace. With Israel surrounded by enemies, the person who can finally resolve these endless and previously unsolvable conflicts uh, plaguing Israel and its Islamic neighbors, this person will be lauded as the greatest diplomat of all time. Now remember, last week we talked and Daniel predicted this man's arrival uh, when he said, there is a prince who is to come who will make a covenant with Israel to protect her from her enemies. And we saw that in Daniel chapter 9, verses 26 and 27. And he will have the support of all the nations of the earth. So picture this. The church is gone. Things are getting really chaotic. Can you imagine America just right now without the church in it, without the spirit being here? Can you imagine it? As crazy it is, as it is right now, just how crazy it's going to be. When we look at the Antichrist and we think about him, and remember he's the one who is, uh, he's the counterfeit to Jesus. There are over 100 passages of scripture uh, that describes the Antichrist. And yet the word Antichrist itself is mentioned only in four verses in the New Testament. And you see it in 1 John and 2 John. But here are some of the Antichrist's aliases. I'm going to run through them quickly. Uh, he's called the Abomination of Desolation. We saw that last week in Daniel. A fierce king, a master of intrigue, the prince who is to come, a despicable man, a worthless shepherd, the son of destruction, the lawless one, the beast. These are not good words describing a good person. But for the first three and a half years, people are going to just be, be thinking he's the greatest thing since chocolate milk because he has finally brought peace to the Middle East. So I want us to go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at this man of lawlessness, this Antichrist. And we're going to see what Paul says to the church at Thessalonica. He says now, verse 1, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to Him, caught up, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So in other words, there were people saying Jesus has already returned, the second coming has happened, the Antichrist or this man of lawlessness that we're going to talk about has, has already come and, and gone. And, and, and Paul is saying, no, when you hear that, understand that's not true. Verse 3, let no one deceive you in any way, 
For that day will not come, catch this, unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. He's saying all these things have to take place before Jesus' second coming to the earth. He's coming in the air to take the church away, but Paul is talking about his second coming to the earth. And this man who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Remember, that's the abomination of desolation that we talked about with Daniel last week. He goes into the temple and he desecrates the temple. And he, uh, Paul says, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? Paul's trying to help them to understand. We've talked about this before, and you've got to catch this. The Lord has not come back for His second coming yet. Because this man, this, this, uh, this uh, abomination of desolation, if you will, he has not uh, desecrated the temple yet. Because we don't have a temple at this point. There is no temple. It's been destroyed. Jump down to verse 6, and this is very important for us to understand, and, I, and we get a lot of questions about this and a lot of challenge. Verse 6 says, And you know what is restraining him. You know what is restraining this man of sorrows, this abomination of desolation. You know what's restraining this Antichrist. And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. So he's being restrained. Even now he's being restrained. He's not on the scene yet. For the mystery, verse 7, of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. Please catch this. Verses 6 and 7 said that the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, is being restrained. And it's the Spirit of God that's restraining him. The church is here. We have the Holy Spirit within us. The Holy Spirit is moving around the earth and he's, he's convicting and he's drawing people. Paul is saying the mystery of lawlessness, lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains him will do so until he is out of the way. So the Holy Spirit is going to be taken out of the way. The church is going to be removed. And people will argue against this. No, the Holy Spirit's got to be here for people to be saved. And we're going to talk about that later. But salvation during the tribulation period is not going to be like it is now during the church age where the Holy Spirit comes and convicts and we give in to that conviction and we pray believing in Jesus that He, that he, uh, he died on the cross and He rose again on the third day believing that He is God. That's not how people are going to be actually saved out of the tribulation. It's going to have to do with the mark of the beast. It's going to have to do with what you accept, what you don't accept. And again, that's for a later week, and we will talk about that. But Paul is saying, when this happens, when the restrainer is taken out, then the lawless one will be revealed. And then he talks about Jesus, and you know, he goes from the very beginning of the seven years to the end, and he gets right to the point. This is the one that Jesus is going to kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. You see, Satan gives the Antichrist his power, his throne, his authority. Satan is the anti-God. The Antichrist is his um, word, if you will. Jesus is the word of God who came uh, in bodily form. And so Satan is going to give the Antichrist his power. Uh, and he's going to seat him on a throne. And he's going to give him his authority. And remember, Jesus said when he was here, everything that he does, he does not do upon his own will. He does what he hears the Father say to do. He does what he sees the Father do. And he said, I'm here to bring glory and honor to the Father. So Satan's got his cheap Messiah, if you will, his anti-Messiah, his antichrist, who is pointing to Satan. And then we see that Jesus said when he goes away, he's going to send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to point to Jesus, who points to the Father. Well, Satan sets up the antichrist who we're going to reveal later, there's going to be the false prophet, who is the false Holy Spirit, if you will, and he's going to point to the Antichrist, who points to Satan. So everything's a bunch of counterfeit going on. But these prophecies that we've read and see serve as a warning, alerting us to traumatic events uh, coming in the future that we can either, catch this, we can either prepare for or avoid by following God's directives uh, and, and by depending upon His providence. Now, what do I mean that we can either prepare for? Listen, 
the people who are going to be left behind, if we've shared with them the things that I'm sharing with you, then at least they will have an understanding of what's happening and they will be able to not receive that mark which will send them eventually straight to hell. Okay, If they ever take the mark, it's over with. There is no returning. There is no salvation from receiving, receiving the mark of the beast because they will have to have it to eat. They will have to have it to, uh, to get to medical attention. They will have to have it to get gas. They will have to have this mark. And so if we're allowing and helping people to understand this, then we are at least preparing them if they're not willing to receive Christ uh, right now. If Jesus were to return tonight, they're going to be left behind. If he were to return to earth tonight, they are left behind. But if they have a knowledge and an understanding of what's going to take place, then they will be able to avoid it. But for us, I think it's so important that we're sharing Jesus now so people can avoid it totally. They don't have to go through it at all because as a child of God, I'm going to be in heaven when all this is going on. And I think the Bible is crystal clear. I don't see where people get the mess up over it, except that Satan is alive and well today, and he can get into the minds of people, and he's, he's lying to people. Remember, he's a liar and the father of all liars. When he speaks, he does not speak the truth because there is no truth in him. So he's deceiving, he's lying, and people are listening to it. Religious leaders are confusing people by saying, well, I don't think the Bible really says that. And Satan is using them as pawns to keep people in the dark, to keep people ignorant of what's taking place and what is to come. But here's something I want us to, to understand, and, and I will close with this. Of much greater importance than to be looking for the Antichrist. I'm not looking for him. If I see him, there's a problem. I've missed something. So greater importance than to be looking for the Antichrist is to be looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We see that in Titus 2.13. That's what we should be looking for, the return of Jesus. We should be excited about the fact that He could come at any moment. That should not scare us. What should scare us and bother us is that there are so many people that we know who don't know Jesus. That's why it's so important in these last days that we're telling people of Jesus and of His love and we're getting them prepared. And if nothing else, we are preparing them so that when this man of lawlessness, this Antichrist, does come upon the scene, they're going to realize that the church has been taken out by Jesus Himself, not by spaceships or aliens or, or whatever. And so they're going to know what they're going to have to do in order to be saved from all of that mess, those things that are to come, the wrath of God that is coming upon this earth. So instead of us looking forward to the Antichrist and looking out for him and wondering, who is he? Who do you think he is? We don't know. And he won't be known until the day that he steps on the scene. And again, you don't want to be here. Okay. So stick with us. We'll get more next week. We're going to talk about the false prophet, uh, the one who uh, counterfeits the Holy Spirit. And then we'll start talking about some of the things, the events that are going to be happening during this tribulation period and uh, get to the end of it. We're going to see some glorious things. So love you guys. And uh, I pray that you go read this. Read this for yourself. Don't just take every week what I say and just lay it to the side and, and wait for me next week to pick it back up. Read it. Get into God's Word. Learn it. Be prepared. Know what it says. Know what it means. And it'll make your life a whole lot better. You'll have a lot more joy. You'll have a lot, a lot more peace. And these things that we read about in, in Revelation, they won't scare you. They really will excite you knowing that we're close to Jesus returning. So, love you guys. If you have any questions, please holler at me. And um, just keep your head up. Keep your focus on Jesus. And remember, in everything, give thanks. Because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So, Father, we do thank you. We thank you for your word, for your love, your mercy, your grace. Father, for those who have listened to my words today, your words, Lord, from your word. I pray, Father, that that one who may not know you, that today, that they would, by faith, just accept that Jesus is Lord. They'll confess it. They'll believe in their heart that you, Lord, raised him from the dead. 
and that he lives forevermore, victorious over death, hell, and the grave, and that they will call upon him for salvation. And Father, for the rest of us, I pray, Lord, that we claim, those of us who claim the name of Christ, that, Lord, we will let our light shine for you, that we'll be a witness in the world, and that, Lord, we will make a difference. Thank you. We praise you. We honor and adore you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week and know that you're loved.